Hello everyone and welcome. Um, this is um, a talk on trust and betrayal in the classroom uh, by Alan Zhang. Uh, Alan is going to talk to us about um, week-long mega games that he runs for his students at uh, Carleton University in Canada. Um, so over to you Alan, I'll uh, let you take it away. Great, thank you, fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, a quick summary of what you're about to see. Uh, so I ran my, my, my credentials, I guess I've ran two mega games <laughs> compared to many of you veterans. I think that's, that's a very, very neophyte. Um, but in the last year or so, I ran two online mega games um, and uh, these happened in uh, March and November of last year at Carleton University, but this was for uh, an upper year course. So this, this course code, probably cryptic to most people, um, is that this is a cross listed both uh, a senior undergraduate course and a graduate course. So we had a mix of grad students and undergrads in this class um, from both Carleton University and University of Ottawa, because our grad programs are all sort of uh, interlinked between the two universities. And it followed what turns out to be an unusual format. I did not realize this either, um, that this was rather than it being a single day, it was spread over a week. It's an educational environment. It followed what's, what we call a blended format, which I'll explain later. Um, and it was adapted from Watch the Skies, which uh, I, I've seen the last two days, very popular um, uh, mega game. And uh, more than that, uh, well, sort of in between these two sessions, we realized there were a number of issues, a uh, number of sort of pain points I wanted to address. And I've been working with a student developer, uh, Forrest, uh, some of you might know, um, on designing a digital tool to facilitate these kinds of online mega games. And we're hoping to eventually be able to make this tool available um, to anyone who wants to use it. Uh, it's open source. Um, and I'll go over a bit about what we've done with that. So uh, this is sort of an outline of the talk. I'll be talking a bit about myself, and then we'll talk about how sort of mega games fit in with learning and education, what kind of constraints we're working with. Uh, and then we'll spend most of the, the, the time talking about how I translated the Watch the Skies game to this online blended format, um, what I needed to sort of look out for, and maybe things that uh, might be helpful to other people who are thinking about translating games in the same way. Um, and we'll talk about a bit about the results, right? What happened? How did we do? Um, and then we'll talk about the tool that uh, Forrest built uh, for online, uh, for facilitating online mega games. So, uh, as as uh, as you've heard, my name is Alan Sang. I'm a new professor, relatively new professor at Carleton University. I started during a very auspicious period uh, in in uh, fall of 2020. Um, and that was during during a very chaotic era. Uh, Carleton University is in Ottawa. You can see, see me posing here. This was during my interviews. I've, I've actually not gone to Ottawa since my interview at the university prior to getting hired. Um, it's sort of the state of affairs. It's, it's all kind of, uh, uh, yeah, we're making do. Uh, a lot of it is remote right now. So I work with the computer, uh, the School of Computer Science. I'm a computer science professor um, and computer science sort of my training. Um, and prior to that, a big shift from sort of the, the cold winter of Canada, I was from uh, Singapore, I was doing a postdoc there at the National University of Singapore, um, where it's very hot and humid all the time. So my sort of, I guess, geek cred, my origin story by now, I think this is quite familiar to most people. This is a, a familiar story to most people. I think most people have come into it through similar means. Um, I was a hobbyist gamer. I played both uh, tabletop RPGs and uh, video games. Um, I've actually, I, I GM'd my first game in high school and then I sort of took a hiatus while I was at university and I relapsed back into RPGs during my PhD. Um, and I've been GMing sort of mostly for the past, uh, past eight years, various uh, campaigns. Um, I'm an avid hacker of RPG systems. Whenever I see something, I, I kind of think about like, how can I, make this different? How can I adjust it to, to sort of like for, to achieve a particular flavor? Um, and so these, these turn out to be very useful skills when, when we're looking at uh, adapting, adapting mega games for education. So I've not actually played a mega game um, at the time and actually still have not played a mega game yet. So I saw, I saw uh, as most people have, I think, who were introduced recently to the hobby, um, I saw SUSD's uh, Watch the Skies YouTube video. I remember this was in Singapore. I was watching. I was like, oh, this is, this is very neat. I, I would love to run something like this or be involved. Uh, at some point, I had this idea of running one in Singapore. I was sort of tied in with the, uh, the indie RPG scene there. Um, but I just never got around to it. I had a bunch of other stuff going on. I was running uh, tabletop, conventional tabletop RPGs. And so 
um, this was sort of floating in my mind already. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought about running it just for fun. And at some point I decided that this was uh, something maybe I'd want to do for educational purposes as well. So a bit about my research. Um, so I research and teach multi-agent systems. Uh, multi-agent systems is the uh, mathematical and computational models of uh, decision making. So we're, we're constructing, it, it deals with math, it deals with computers, and we're trying to model how people make decisions, people, machines, entities. Um, we talk about communities of agents, right? So we have a community of agents. All of these agents are trying to make decisions, right? They, they have some kind of agenda or some kind of uh, preference, and they want to make decisions in this environment such that they can benefit themselves. And more than that, these agents are directly affected by decisions of other agents, right? What, whatever uh, you do can affect other agents, and what, what they do might incidentally affect your, uh, your happiness, right? Your satisfaction with the outcome. So look at a Look at a, a very simple example here. Here we have um, a single robot, right? And so this is this is a classical, like a '70s AI problem. Right? A robot sees a bunch of blocks. Um, it really wants this blue block at the bottom for whatever reason, but it's underneath these other uh, red blocks that it doesn't care about. So it needs to formulate a plan. This is classic AI. Right? This is classic optimization problems. How do I get this block? Well, okay, I need to. The robot realizes, okay, I need to move these top blocks out of the way so I can pick up. Uh, these other blocks, right? There we go. The robot is now happy. It has the blue block that it wants. Multi-agent system says, well, what happens when you have other robots, right? Other robots are also making decisions rationally. They also have something, right? They also have their own preferences. In this case, perhaps the other robots also want this blue block. And now what are we thinking? What is this robot thinking? It's thinking whether or not I should move these red blocks out of the way. But what if I'm busy moving these red blocks, one of the other, uh, one of the other robots comes in and sneaks, uh, sneaks away with the, uh, with the block that I actually want. What happens then? What should I do here? Right, so this is, this is multi-agent systems uh, in, in the sense that there are multiple agents that we're studying. And it has a lot of applications. Um, it's been applied to voting, right? international relations. Here we have agents as rational entities, somewhat rational entities, um, being the, the nations, for example, uh, or being voters. Uh, we also study uh, social networks. Recently, we're looking at misinformation, right? How do, how do misinformation move through networks of agents? Uh, we also look at fair division of resources. Uh, and the design of markets and auctions, right? A lot of like you know, real world, big, big applications. Um, but there's also this direct analogy to games, right? If we're thinking about an environment where agents, players need to make decisions where the, the, the happiness of a player is dependent on not only what decisions they make, but also what decisions other people make. Well, this is exactly a setup for any kind of multiplayer game, right? for example, chess or poker. Uh, or even uh, games more widely defined, not just board games like tennis and soccer or football in the UK. Um, and so one of the one of the major tools that we use in multi-agent systems is game theory. Right here we're talking about economic game theory. So I'll give what is maybe the most classic example of game theory. Um, suppose you and your friend, right? We've got to put friend in big quotes here, your compatriot. Um, has robbed the bank, and then you were you were caught, right? Um, and now you have a choice. Right? The police are now interrogating you. They they separate you, of course, so you can't you know plan a story together. And they're they're interrogating you, and you have this the, you have these options available to you. You can you can either remain silent, right? Because it's your friend after all. And you should you know be be you know, in some kind of honor among thieves. Um, or you could confess, right? You've got all of this evidence. You could rat up your friend for sure. They would have to be. You know, they would be thrown in jail. Well, what do you do here? Right? What, is, what do you do in such a situation? And I think we all recognize this as prisoner's dilemma. It's mentioned many, many times in sort of various media. Um, it's perhaps the most uh, popular example of, uh, of sort of game theory um, scenarios. And we can draw out the full matrix, right? So previously, before I had this sort of simplified matrix, this is called game matrix. Uh, here I've added sort of the, the consequences for the other person, right? So if you both stay silent, uh, you're, we, we come up with this outcome. Both of you are sort of incriminated, but the police don't have enough on you to really put you away. You get a slap on the wrist, maybe you get one year each, right? If you, you rat out your friend, 
your friend um, and they, they remain silent, well, you get to go free, right? You've kind of made a deal uh, and your, your friend gets put away for four years, comes back as a super villain or something. Right. And vice versa, right? If you remain silent, your friend rats you out, well, then it's the opposite scenario. You get put away for a long time, your friend uh, walks, walks off free. Um, and of course, if you both rat each other out, that's kind of like the worst scenario because now you get both put away, maybe not as badly as before if you were the only one, uh, but certainly this is if you just add up the years, right? This is the, the kind of worst case scenario, total of six years. So what do you do here? This is a classic game theory scenario. Game theory, cold math logic says, um, notice no matter what your friend is doing, if you confess, or if you rat your friend out, you will reduce your sentence by a year. And this is this is mathematically true. Right? You could just look at the, the columns here, right? No matter uh, what your what your friend is doing, um, you can confess and either get reduce a, a one year sentence to zero or reduce a four year sentence to three. Right. So it doesn't matter what your friend is doing. You should just rat them out. That's what cold logic says, right? So you should confess. But if your friend is also a mathematician, they also understand this, right? They, they have the exact uh, uh, mirror image of this problem. And they also think to themselves, well, no matter, no matter what you do, I should also confess. Right? I should also wrap you out, uh, which of course then uh, leads to this, what I what already described as sort of the worst of these outcomes, right? Cold logic says, both people confess there's a failure to cooperate, right? thinking from the, the player's perspective, uh, and, and we end up in, in the sort of the worst case scenario. Now, of course, the class goes into much more mathematical rigor. There's a lot of notation involved. We also talk about other scenarios. This is, in some sense, the simplest one. We talk about uh, constructing options. We talk about um, sort of social choice dilemmas like voting or fair division of resources. We talk about designing markets and mechanisms. Right? And there's a lot of uh, these, what we call in mathematics, stylized models, which is to say greatly simplified models. Um, and, and it's nice when we're working with them because they have nice mathematical properties, they're easy to analyze. Um, but the real world frequently is, is not so simple, right? Uh, maybe frequently information is easy, it's not easy to get access to. You don't really know what the outcomes are. We don't really know what the consequences are. Um, how do these models hold up? And what happens when the stakes are real? And this, this is something that, that is difficult to do in a classroom. Um, we can, of course, set up simple games. And there are, of course, the simple games that you could do in a classroom, right? Could, uh, I, myself, we, we've seen auctioning off of a coffee, right? Have uh, auction off a of coffee and see what happens there. But in the end, we know how much exactly that coffee is worth. And right? that coffee from uh, Tim Hortons in Canada might be $2, right? Donuts, another $2. Um, so that's a $4 coffee and donut. That's exactly how much we're willing to pay for it. So this is information is very, again, very stylized. And it's kind of a toy model, even when we're doing these sort of, uh, doing these um, sort of uh, playing out these games. Um, how do we, how do we get some degree of realism here? I want real stakes for the students um, because only when you have real stakes do these models actually sort of come into play. Otherwise, people are just pushing around $5. Right? Um, and so how do we do that? Well, one of the ways we can do that is what's called experiential learning. Um, and this is where this is an entire sort of pedagogical teaching method uh, where we take a, stu a student, a learner, and we place them in a situation where they need to use the skills that they, they're learning. Um, and it shows them that the thing that they're learning is relevant. It shows them that there are real world uses for these skills. And it creates a memorable experience, right? sort of hands-on learning. Um, and it's been shown to improve ret re retainment of these skills, retention of these skills. Yeah. And in a lot of hands-on domain, um, this can be used very well. So for example, you're teaching wilderness survival, right? You, you put someone out there, have them camp for a day, they will learn, right? They will remember these lessons. Uh, programming is another example, right? There are various degrees of uh, sort of theoretical programming exercises, but you could also send someone to do a project on a real thing or, or make a website and make an app, right? So these are, these are experiential learning techniques. It's trickier though, when you have something like math. Right, when you have something that's much more theoretical, uh, what is what is a hands-on domain for calculus? Right? And so what I posit is mega games uh, work very well as experiential learning for game theory. 
right? more so than sort of small game theory exercises. Um, and this is game theory in some sense with more real stakes, right? At least certainly um, in scenarios where uh, there is some degree of stakes that corresponds to a real stake in the real world. And these are complex situations with many unknowns uh, and ex externalities, right? The world is very messy. There are things that relate to each other in weird ways um, that isn't captured in stylized models. And it's an opportunity for them to use the tools of the class, right? Either to use them to analyze situation or to use them to resolve disputes. And we've seen examples of both of those uh, in, in our games. So, um, that's sort of the, the motivation behind all of this. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of how, how it came to be, right? So remember this was in uh, 2021, right? The world was still super chaotic. Uh, for us at Carleton, uh, all of the learning was remote and online. Um, and so educators were encouraged to uh, sort of experiment with different formats for delivery of their courses. Uh, there was, of course, synchronous delivery, right? This was a, a classic lecture that was live streamed to the students. Um, the students attended live, they asked questions live, and sort of what we're doing now, unless you're watching the video. Um, and this was good for uh, sort of um, um, more discussion-based courses, right, where uh, real-time feedback is needed. If you're watching the video, then um, what you're experiencing is asynchronous delivery. Right? This inc included recorded videos, um, and it's very similar to sort of online degree platforms like Coursera. And of course, there was sort of a blended approach, which just says, okay, well, we'll mix and match, right? Maybe you did your lectures recorded, and then you uh, you had some kind of QA that was live. And so that was a blended, blended degree of uh, a blended uh, delivery approach. And so we were encouraged to sort of experiment with different things to try to make it work, right? Make make uh, improve student engagement and sort of make the make the, the the lesson still relevant, right? Rather than turning everything into just a series of slides and videos. And I had experimented in the previous semester um, with uh, 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 another uh, another course uh, where I taught computer science and ethics. Um, and that was also very experimental, followed very different formats, and was very successful, was very well received by students. And I had feedback from other professors that I also heard good things about this course. And so I said, well, why not also try something new here? Right? That gave me sort of the, the, the impetus to be like, oh, let's try something else that's also kind of experimental. And so cue watch the skies, right? And, and I think you're all familiar with this, watch the skies. Um, in this game, in this mega game, uh, the players, um, participants or national governments, right, where they cooperate and compete in the presence of a uh, growing sort of alien threat, right, we don't really know. Um, and this was a really good mega game for, uh, for us to adapt to an educational environment uh, because it was very accessible, right, the setting is the real world plus a little bit more. Um, all of the students kind of knew something about international politics, including students that were not from Canada, right? Including students that were from other countries uh, that did not speak English as their first language. But they also probably knew something about international politics. Um, and so these were familiar terms. It was easy to get buy in and uh, 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 sort of get the background knowledge for the students. The sort of science fiction angle, right? So I said it sort of like nebulously in the near future, and there were aliens involved, gave it a little bit more detachment from kind of the modern tensions, uh, which could potentially make the, the, the activity a bit more uncomfortable for certain students. So I thought it was a good combination of both of these factors. However, there were a bunch of challenges, right? Mega, mega games take place in person. Uh, they have a large support team and they have a control team that has four to five people, maybe even more for larger games. They're played over several hours. All of these were not resources that were available. These were hard constraints. Um, and I needed to fit in, fit, have it fit in within a, the framework of an online course. I could not tell them set aside eight hours of this day and we'll do a thing. Um, it had to be, it had to fit within their class schedules in some way. Uh, and also there was just one of me. <laughs> there was no, no one else helping with this, certainly not for the first iteration of this. Uh, and so my solution was, this, well, why not take that blended approach that we were sort of encouraged to try and then take the mega game, see if it fit it into this blended um, sort of program. And so my solution was to take the, the mega game, which proceeds in turns, and just take one turn per day and spread it out over the course of a week. It turned out to be about a week and a half when we took the weekend off. Um, 
And so uh, we reorganized the turn structure. There's a lot of distinct phases in, uh, in the mega game in Watch the Skies. And we reorganized everything so that there was basically two phases, where right? there was turn processing, where all of, the, all of the important synchronous stuff needed to happen, right? all of the military maneuvers, the interception game, um, those all happened during pro turn processing and students had to attend that, or certain students, if you had a particular role, you had to attend that live. And we turned out many students more than the lectures, more people attended those than the lectures, which was kind of funny. Uh, and then the rest of the day was asynchronous discussions, right? The UN would happen over the course of the rest of the day. Uh, however, there was, there was just one of me. There was sort of no getting around that, unfortunately. So we chose Discord as our platform of choice for running the mega game. Uh, basically, all, all computer science students had Discord. This was a consistent message um, that I got when I was talking to students, talking to TAs. Um, so this was the thing they already used. Um, and already, our courses already use it as an informal uh, forum. I, I used it in my ethics course as a way of facilitating discussions. And so how do we translate this mega game into this online environment of a Discord server, um, and what needs to be translated, right? This was not clear when we first started, uh, what parts of the game actually need to be translated? How do we articulate this in kind of a principled way? And so I'm gonna introduce this concept of affordances. This idea of affordance comes from sort of design. I myself got it from computer design, which is uh, human computer interactions, but this is a, a conventional object design word. Uh, affordances are the ways in which an object invites you to interact with it. So for example, uh, door handles versus the push panels on doors is, uh, offers two different kinds of affordances, right? Uh, a, a push panel on a door says, uh, please push to enter this door. Right? And a door handle says, please pull to open this door. And thinking about affordances of the physical game objects tells us a bit about what might need to be translated, certainly draws our attention to the modes that the game operates in. And then we can see to see if those modes translate well to an online medium. Because if you don't match the affordances, if you don't work with the affordances of the medium, you get, you get a mess like this, right? Like, I'm sure this, this resonates with people, right? When you look at that door, do you push or do you pull? It's unclear, right? It's unclear if you push or pull on this because the affordance is unclear. And so if you're not working with the affordances of the medium, then you're gonna be swimming upstream. So one of the big affordances of uh, in-person mega game is that there are rooms and tables, right? Uh, Watch Disguise has very specific instructions about how you should lay out your room and scheduling people uh, moving between these rooms. And I sort of identify two reasons why that might be. One is that this idea of division of labor, right? To take your team and break it into parts, both to facilitate communications on, and to impede communication, right? So it had this idea of division of labor. Um, and it was also needed to get these different roles, these different people to certain places to either give them an announcement or information um, or to do a mini game or do some kind of activity. And what does this mean for an online medium? Um, for an online medium, I conjecture that we didn't actually need the pacing component. We didn't need to marshal people very aggressively because Discord already has a lot of tools for marshaling players. We can, all, we can just put a Discord message that at everyone, please come into this channel now, we're doing a thing. Right? And so I don't think we needed a, a strict scheduling of, uh, of times of the day where certain things happen, except for, of course, the, the turn processing. And this court also gives you private channels and roles, and we see that in sort of in use uh, for the uh, for the mega game uh, now and yesterday uh, and, and likely tomorrow. And these roles help uh, separate the players out into teams and into different um, or into different roles. So this is what we did for our Discord server. So this is just a listing of some of the channels that were available. So for example, we had. Um, sort of these world news and media release channels for everyone, uh, announcements from, from, uh, from control from me, uh, but also uh, announcements from the, the students themselves, right? The heads of states might, might justify why they've just declared war, for example. Uh, and then we have uh, the UN and the World Summit. These are rooms that would have been in the original uh, Watch the Skies, and we've just directly translated into, in, into channels with special permissions on them. Um, 
And then we also were able to create rooms. Right? This is a thing we can't do in the real in the real world, but we can just create a room at a table that says, okay, this is the table that corresponds to this specific event in the game. Right? So here we have a rocket auction. Um, and we could also add uh, channels to facilitate inter-team communication. So here we have the red phone between Moscow and Washington. Uh, we also had separate uh, rooms for the, the mini games, essentially. So we have the war room where we have the interceptor and military mini games. And then we have the operations room where we have the special agent mini game. And we also had extra channels to facilitate information. So we had uh, treaties that were being signed in one channel. And we had another channel for uh, exchanges, which I'll explain later. Uh, this is how, how uh, teams need to sort of uh, give, each other, give each other tokens, right? Facilitate trades. Uh, between between teams. Um, I also added a bunch of, uh, sort of public voice channels. Um, I gave them creative names, but I never saw these in use. And we'll see why. We'll see why later, why we never saw these in use. Um, and of course, there are team-specific channels so that they can talk within their team, and I can kind of spy in on them, see what they're planning. Uh, planning. Another physical affordance, right? Affordance in the physical game is uh, the map, right? This is like a big deal, right? The map is always something that's prominently featured in media for mega games. Um, and it, it, its affordances is, is that it, it allows people to place tokens, right? Military assets, UFOs, uh, UN crises tokens, um, and represents a commitment of resource. The placement of a token is a commitment of resource. It says, I am deploying something and I'm not gonna take it back, right? I cannot take it back. Um, and it's also very dramatic, right? That's that's important to recognize that yes, this is a map. Something is happening on this map, right? Uh, yesterday we 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 heard about uh, the the mushroom cloud tokens that gets placed on these maps, right? Very dramatic. Um, and how can we emulate this in the digital environment? Uh, we can't. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't. And if someone has has some ideas here, I'm happy to hear it. But there are no low barrier of entry tools for em emulating a map develop, especially if you want proper permission settings so that either a, either a, a malicious a player or a player who just doesn't know what they're doing doesn't accidentally start moving things around. There are a number of whiteboard tools, right? There are a bunch of, you could use Roll20, you could use uh, uh, Tabletop Simulator, but these are either very high entry tools or not suitable for many players, a large number of players, um, or you know, variously difficult to use. And so we just removed it. Um, we removed the map, which seems like, I think, a pretty big uh, thing to just take out. But I think it worked fine. Um, of course, we don't get the, the dramatic um, sort of reveal of putting things on the map anymore. But that was difficult to do online anyway. Um, whenever something happened, I would be, be careful to describe the location. Right? And if the location is especially sort of obscure um, or at least not super common knowledge, uh, then I would sort of also highlight nearby near, nearby player nations that would be affected. Right? So we had wildfires in the Cascadia. Which some people didn't know where that was. So I highlighted this was Western Canada and the U.S. Um, we had we had an event on a disputed island between um, Korea, Japan, and China. Cards play a big role in the games as well. Um, they play a big role in many different ways. And one of the ways they play a big role is as a randomization engine. So here are cards from Watch the Skies, right? They, um, it, it's, it's cleverly compacted into, uh, with, with multiple randomizers on these cards so that you didn't have to have that many cards. Um, but really it's just an RNG device, right? These are used for military actions, agent actions um, and interceptions. Uh, and in, in statistics, right, remember your stats class or your finite class or discrete math class, right? These are drawn with replacement, right? So when you draw the card, you put it back in the deck and you reshuffle. Uh, what this means is that effectively these are die rollers, right? These are just a dice roller. Um, and you could just emulate these using a quick piece of computer code, some dice and a table. Um, or I chose to use perchance. Perchance.org lets you code custom tables. Um, they can be actually quite complicated, but even very simple ones like this uh, work just fine. Right? So I coded this up one. This is what I actually use for resolving military conflicts. It's basically a glorified die roller. Um, I have added some extra features here just to make it like prettier. Um, and what, if you wanted to use this, you could definitely use this you could code up. It would take you only five, 10 minutes to learn how to use it. It's fairly simple. Uh, do be aware that if you share the URL, right, if you share screen and it has the URL, the students will be able to see the code, even if you're not displaying it, um, because the, the website lets you copy any kind of uh, 
any kind of uh, any kind of um, table basically just by clicking on the link. Um, and so that might or might not be an affordance you want your students to have because in the real game they don't get to look through the deck to count what their odds are. They kind of have to figure it out through the game. Um, and so that might be a thing you might want to avoid. Other kinds of cards that are in play, I call them tokens because tokens uh, represent resources that can be hoarded or spent or committed. These are all the affordances of tokens. And importantly, they can be exchanged between the players without controls involvement. Right? And how do we emulate these tokens? This was a huge problem. There is also no digital solution for this that is good. Um, and in fact, any kind of digital solution for tracking tokens between a large number of people inevitably either involve a centralized database or a distributed public ledger. And a centralized database is basically a spreadsheet. Right? It's a, either a spreadsheet that is either editable by everyone, in which case you're relying on the honor system, um, and a, a great deal of confidence in their ability to do arithmetics, uh, a degree of confidence that I do not attribute to myself. So I would not really recommend this unless you had a good way of checking. Um, or it has to be manually tracked by control, which is also a big headache. This is a big, big time thing. Um, if you're curious what a distributed public ledger is, uh, this is a blockchain. Right? And I guess it could be another talk where we talk about blockchains, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so uh, this is what our interface looked like. Right? This is a, basically a Google Sheet that I just made look a little bit more pretty. And I manually tracked tokens for each team. And every time someone wanted to trade, uh, they would post a little message. We'd sign off, the teams would sign off on it. And then I would manually make this change and then put a little check mark next to it to tell them that this was done. And this was, would be updated every turn. I would just take a screenshot and share it. I can't send the link because Google Sheets doesn't let me set permissions per tab. And these were all tabs in the same document. And so, um, this was all super duper manual, and this would actually be one of the major pain points for running this game uh, and would inspire our student project. So I think this is the last one of the, the physical affordances is interruptions, right? Interrupts are whenever um, someone says, wait, no, I have a thing to do, right? And this is a classic interrupt from Magic the Gathering, the counter spell card. Wait, no, you don't get to do that. I'm going to play this card. Right. And uh, in, in Watch the Skies, there are special action cards that do similar things. Right. So and in, in real life, this is very easy to do because there is a lot of body language involved. Right? You can just shout over someone. Um, these are real time interactions and none of these are feasibly translated online um, or rather they can. Right. Magic the Gathering has an online implementation, but it means that uh, play priority passes between the player and that can actually use up a huge amount of time. And we're, when we're in sort of an informal environment like a Discord, um, people could have stepped away, right? So if you're waiting for another country to see if they want to interrupt, um, then that person might have been distracted, they might have tabbed out, or they might have walked off to get a cup of tea. Uh, and now the entire class is waiting like an extra minute for this one thing. Um, and there might be many of these opportunities. And so the solution was just that we removed all the special action cards, uh, which is regrettable, uh, but I don't think it detracts from the learning side of things. And I think it's possible to just carefully look at all of these action cards, rewrite them so that there is, if they're not an interrupt, they're a play before, right? Play before this action to do something. Um, and by rewriting them, we can, we can reintroduce them so that they are not interrupts and they're, I guess in Magic the Gathering, they're sorceries. So uh, there are a bunch of physical affordances, but there's also digital affordances that we get for being on Discord. And these are worthwhile considering too, because if you don't, if you, if you don't account for them, think two, one of two things can happen, right? The games that make use of these will just run more smoothly, right? P games that take advantage of Discord affordances or online affordances will just run more smoothly. But games that work against them that that somehow if their game breaks down if these affordances are used you will find yourself swimming upstream and so that i've identified sort of three main ones one is the ease of communication between the players and this comes in a variety of forms but generally it's very easy for players to message each other even in the middle of like a tense exchange right in in a physical game this could be in the war room right the the general the the, the, the chief of defense deciding whether or not to attack another team's interceptors um 
in, in Discord, they can very quickly check with their team who might also be listening in on the, on the Zoom call um, because I allow them to that just for fun. Right? They can make a decision together. Whereas in a real, uh, in, in real in-person game, the, 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 the uh, chief of defense needs to make that call and then come back and be like, yeah, so we're at war with China now, sorry. Uh, right? And we can't isolate a player from the team. It's very infeasible to do that. Um, and it weakens this notion of division of labor. We feel that's an important component of play. Um, and it's easier for a play player to get a full picture. Right? We heard that it's sometimes a defining feature of a mega game. Sometimes you don't know what's going on. And even though maybe that was going on right beside you, you only find out after the fact. Uh, and this is much more difficult to do in an in a online mega game. Uh, and one way to sort of um, combat this push back against this is just emphasize, you need to make the call, right? You have the authority to make this call as the chief of defense right now. Um, and that's only effective to a certain degree if the player or right, the student wants to sort of buy in on it. Um, it's also easy for players to communicate across teams. And this is something for, for, uh, for, for I guess, instructors, right? Sometimes this, is, this happens outside of course supervisions, which might be a concern for uh, certain institutions, right? Because now you have course activity, core course activities that are happening outside of the, the instructor's control. Um, and we actually sort of devise a solution that partially patches this, right? If we make it very easy for students to set up uh, channels within the Discord server to communicate with other teams, uh, they will, it turns out they will take advantage of it. Another ease of communication affordance is that everything you post online is there forever. And in the sense that on a Discord server, anytime you send out information, it will be screenshotted and shared with other people. If you send out a file that has a PDF that has the, you know, the UN crisis, that will be shared between the players. In fact, we, we just had players just asking me, can you just send us a file because we're just gonna get that anyway. Um, and so there's no distortion of information, right? You don't get the broken telegram effect. Um, if you release, and this, this, this actually happened, if you release incriminating information about a particular nation in private, uh, that is considered verified information because they will take a screenshot of that information, right? Professor Allen said, Japan stole this, stole, stole this technology from us, right? It's not hearsay because it's a message that has my name on it, right? Has everything is in black and white, literally, right? Which is really funny because that's not even true because it takes very little effort to edit a screenshot, right? And, and it's not even true, but any student that looks at it will just assume it is true without bothering to think about whether or not this was falsified. And they can't, but they can just ask me, but they won't, right? So it's, it's, it's a very strange state to think about, but I think this bears thinking about what would happen if this actually came up, right? Does the control team verify a message that has been tampered with? Because in some sense, this is very outside of the expectations, uh, very outside of, uh, of uh, affordances that are in this media. And the final one, I think people are quite familiar with this. You could use React emoji for a bunch of things. Um, here we have a poll, right? You could use, uh, you could use polls. Um, this is not uh, voting on a poll, interestingly, is not the same as voting at the ballot booth, right? Uh, this is what's called approval voting, right? It correspond to a ballot that looks something like this where you have multiple check marks. Um, and it tends to pro produce more moderate results. Uh, it's very curious to me because this is part of what I study as research. You could also use it uh, to sign off on proposals or show support of proposals by using the country flag emoji. Uh, and we saw earlier, you could use the green check mark. I use the green check mark now very regularly to just say, I've, this is done, right? Don't worry about it. Um, and then I use a sort of a star emoji to just say, okay, I, I see this instruction. I can't act on it yet, but I'll come back to it later. So results, I'll just go through this very quickly, right? This is the sort of first game that we ran. Again, this is the first game, first mega game that I was involved with and I ran it. Um, and the students were very excited about this. People would have got a tremendous amount of buy-in from the students. Here is uh, the Brazil head of state making, making a collaborative PR announcement that says, oh no, these UFOs are not real. Don't worry about it. Um, we arrange, and I'm not sure, I'm curious if, if Control does this in other games where they sort of conspire for the game to end on a high note by introduction of crises. Right? And so here I introduced for the first game, I introduced, I didn't even really think about it. I just happened to do it. I introduced this, this basically, um, what do you call those? The pinata, it was a loot pinata. It was like a huge horde of alien artifacts in the ocean. And I just 
left it there and said, you can come investigate it. And there was a lot of debate about who, want, who gets what, right? Um, and I thought they would be able to sort it out. And then Russia just says, can I just hijack the ship and run off with it? Um, and that led to almost a shooting war between uh, China and USA. Almost everyone went to DEFCON 1. Uh, we almost had a nuclear exchange. Uh, this was an artifact produced by a student. I will, I will treasure this forever. A student just randomly wrote this just for fun. Uh, she was the, uh, the, the US head of state and she became convinced in the game that her entire staff was mind controlled for some reason. Um, it was very strange because that was definitely not the case. Um, and ended up firing her entire, the rest of her team before they could get her as well. Uh, and then, then she wrote this letter just for fun and released it into the public. So I thought that was, that was the students really enjoyed it, I think. Um, and so in terms of learning outcomes, right, I think we, we the, the game successfully demonstrates how difficult it is in, in the real world to cooperate with people, even, uh, even when there are real stakes, or maybe especially when there are real stakes. Right? And uh, in the game, one nation actually used game theory arguments privately with another country to convince them to hand back stolen technology and pay for reparations, which I thought was quite clever. Uh, another nation tried to actually, this is the same nation, tried to set up auctions um, using the techniques we, we saw in class, uh, and then, but they forgot a crucial part of it. And all the other teams recognize this. Uh, I don't know how much of it, it was in sort of like they instinctively recognize this or if they actually remember stuff from class, but they colluded and just ripped off this team's option, right? Nobody bid on anything except the minimum one megabuck bid. And so they lost a whole bunch of alien artifacts for like one megabuck each. Uh, and I also solicited feedback from students from the form of surveys or informal interviews. Most people thought it was fun, interesting, and memorable. Um, and uh, we use a follow-up assignment. That was sort of the criteria, that was the, the assessment component of this, um, to help the, to, to get them to demonstrate that they were using the learning concepts in, in, during the game, to think about the game, or after the game, to reflect on it. And that was quite successful. Um, most students, uh, or some students wanted more days. Some students thought it was, uh, it was uh, a lot of time to devote, even though we canceled two lectures for this. Um, other students said they would actually pre prefer a condensed format where everything sort of happened in one day or two days. Um, I wasn't, I didn't think that was actually feasible to do. I, I think some students would definitely prefer it, but I think if there's any students who could not do it, then we'd have to call it off. Right? We'd have to be fair to all the students. And so that was sort of the first iteration of this. I'll just run through this very quickly. Uh, we also offer a second uh, iteration of this. I, I, I cleverly renamed this Watch the Stars. Um, because we were changing rules and we were changing the pamphlets. Um, we used the faster interception rules, which I think Kevin pr 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 proposed for our play test over the summer. And we removed the chief scientist ropes because we didn't have enough uh, players. We, I didn't expect to get enough players in the class. Um, and this is where we introduced the Stargazer bot. This was written by Forrest Anderson, who I think some of you know. Uh, and the goal of this was to ease the bookkeeping tasks for a lot of, at the core of these uh, mega games, and the sort of two things that we were able to accomplish, we were able to track current seats, all the tokens we saw before, uh, and, and uh, open custom channels between the teams to keep everything within the server. And so here's Forrest, um, he's the, the sort of developer on this, on this bot. The bot is programmed in Python using Discord libraries. He's a fourth year student at, at Carleton University. He's a veteran of many, uh, many games and he has a lot of sort of computer science accolades. He's a core developer of, uh, of uh, this voxel RPG that's written in Rust. He's very pro Rust. And so here's, here's sort of, uh, his, so, his, his uh, social medias if you want to get in touch with him. And so what the, this, uh, the, the, the Stargazer bot offers is that um, it offers a friendly UI for the, the players to engage with from a player facing perspective. It uses this court sort of button interface um, it's, uh, through its chatbot system and it has admin commands in the form of slash commands. And the information is all stored in the database. Everything needs to be in a database or on a blockchain and we're not gonna use the blockchain. Um, so and everything's sort of recorded. And so in theory, we could perform some data analysis with this. Um, I think that would be a fun thing to do at some point. And it's open source, right? It's still work in progress. I don't think it's quite ready to be used yet, uh, but it is up there if you're curious to take a look. This is what it looks like from the player's perspective. Okay, so this is the bank for Brazil, one of the teams. We can see here that there's a, this is their inventory, right? We've divided currencies into common and rare currencies. Um, we also have sort of logistic currencies, which you cannot trade. Um, 
So I think a pretty slick, useful interface. Um, teams can create custom channels. There's an easy way to do that. We have these interaction buttons here at the bottom. So you click one of these, we click one of them to open comms with another team, uh, ask you what, what teams you want to use uh, to open comms with, and you can select multiple ones you want. And then it creates a custom channel that only those teams have access to. Right. So this was uh, extensively used. Um, there are two pages of these scrollies between, I think we have seven countries, eight countries, seven countries, I think. Um, and so basically every country talked to most other countries, I think. And there were several of these that had multiple countries. So that was quite successful. Uh, we added a payment system. So one of the things that we wanted to do is be able to collect money from the players or mega bucks from the players to fund certain things. So here we have kick style, Kickstarter style funding schemes where you need a certain amount of credits to be collected. Uh, the, from the, the player standpoint, you can click these buttons to add money to the, to the pile. Um, and from the control standpoint, there's a button that we can sort of collect, right? Collect or end, end payments. If there's not enough, everyone gets it back. Um, you could also represent commit of, commitment of resources. So here we have our UN aid tokens, right? These are the standing for UN aid tokens. Um, we need to collect a certain amount of money, but we didn't care exactly how much, right? The more, the better. I probably said something that you need at least six um, and, and uh, it, it keeps track of which countries are paying how much. Here's another one here is uh, readying interceptors, right? So each of the countries um, ready up the interceptors and see how many they have. Right. Here we have uh, the, the leader of UK, glorious Boris Johnson. Uh, the, the, the students got really into the roles. Right? Some of them got really into the roles. Uh, so here with currency trading, this is sort of like the big thing that we have to work on. Um, this idea that we wanted players to be able to exchange resources between themselves without controlling needing to get involved. And so you hit the start trade button and it asks you, well, who do you want to trade with? You can pick the country that you want to trade with. And that will, uh, we're using the threading system, uh, which was just introduced when we were starting, we were going, going strong on the spot. And so we've refactored it to use the threading system. So it creates a thread uh, that's sort of temporary. And within this thread, you can now interact with it, right? The thread says, basically, this is the thing that, this is a trade that you've set up. Um, do you accept trade? Do you want to adjust? Do you want to cancel? And if you hit adjust, Right. Then you have this list of different currencies. Um, we have different currency types. Uh, some currencies are hidden unless you, until you obtain them. So you could have a lot of different currencies. In fact, you could have both the alien and earth currencies all in the same system. And because the earth players never get earth currencies, they just won't ever see them. It won't get in your way. Once you, uh, oh, other currencies are hidden forever, right? So like, you aren't allowed to trade military assets, for example. So it just doesn't show up on the system. Once you select that currency, you can add or subtract a certain amount and that will be reflected in sort of the, the this, this thing on, on top, right? We'll change that. And at some point you agree, it will send the offer to the other team and they will consider it. And if both teams sort of agree on the offer, the bank is, the, the trade is completed, you get a notification. Uh, and your, your bank is sort of updated automatically. And so that that was sort of the core of the bot. Um, you have questions about it? Uh, for us is here, I think, in the audience. Um, yeah, so the feedback for the second iteration was mostly positive, although there were fewer replies. Um, I, I just blamed that on interterm variability. Uh, but the students that re did reply wanted more. They wanted more turns. They thought it was not enough. Um, one person proposed spreading it over the entire semester, which I thought was, would be real bossy. <laughs> would be a real ballsy to do. Um, and uh, so some people thought it took a lot of time. They quoted two hours per day that was playing, which I don't think is actually that much time, but maybe it felt like a lot. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it is from a student's perspective. Um, I this For the second game, I pegged the actual date for it. I just said 2030, that seems like far away. It, it was, students did not agree. They <laughs> thought it was too soon, it was too soon. Another student actually said they wanted more in-depth political briefings. Um, especially regards to like modern day tension. So I'm still debating whether or not to do that. Um, and we had some issues with some countries being too passive. Um, not entirely sure what to do about that. This, this year we had a very passive US uh, team. Um, and so my thought is either we put more players on those teams just to sort of improve the odds they will get someone who's much more active or we pull players and I've sort of resisted doing this because I want it to be symmetrical. Right? I want everyone to have equal chance to be one of the big, big dogs. 
Um, but maybe we do put more, more experienced players on these sort of big important teams. So uh, we're, we're looking at creating the sort of next iteration of the Stargazer bot. It's again, open source and available, but not quite ready to be used. It's a bit of a work in progress. I'm gonna resume work on it over the summer. Um, and uh, I'm personally working on sort of the 2048 version of Watch the Stars. Um, I wanna in incorporate sort of more space, uh, space race uh, elements that we're seeing in media nowadays. Um, and I, I also stumbled on the idea of bringing back alumni as the aliens, because the aliens has such a different team, uh, or has a different, such a different game, it didn't make sense for them to be like student run, or rather the students are running them, don't get the same experience. And so I've been thinking about either incorporating some alumni and many people have, have said, yes, we really want to come back and play as the aliens. Um, so that, that's the thing I'm going to do. Uh, and I do want to play some mega games at some point because I have actually still not played one as a, as a player. Um, I'm very interested in exploring this idea of mega games for pedagogy, right? the, the science of teaching, uh, how can mega games support teaching, um, either specific to sort of my area of study, multi-agent systems, or more widely. I've seen last year we had several talks um, about uh, using mega games for very domain specific scenarios, which I think is very interesting. There are many open questions that we've identified. Um, what are what are the? I'm curious to hear if there are other core interactions in many games that we should incorporate in Stargazer. Um, that 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 the idea of tokens and messaging we thought were core elements. Um, what other interesting mechanics can we add to a classroom mega game that doesn't increase its complexity? Because that's that's also a big issue that if we make the game more complex. The students need to buy in on it, right? They didn't pay to play this game, they paid for an education. And so we can't improve, increase the complexity too much or else they will be like, this is like a lot of weird, this is too weird, right? And so how can we incorporate more interesting mechanics that way? Um, what other mega game studies, or sorry, uh, what, <laughs> what other mega game settings can be used in sort of these generic classrooms? So we've seen mega game being used for very domain specific investigation, which I think is very interesting, uh, but for sort of like my math-based classroom, we can use any setting, but we need ones that are very accessible and easy to grasp. And other educational domains that can benefit from metagames, I think this is, uh, it has a lot of potential. I'd love to be able to examine more metagame rule sets. I'm not actually sure how to go about this. I think I just, do I just buy the other metagames? Um, so if you're a mega game creator and you'd like to sort of talk, I'd love to sort of have a look at what, how you're, how the, how other games are run. So right now I just have uh, Watch the Skies to sort of compare with. Um, and if you'd like a game to try to be translated into an online format, I'm happy to work with you there as well. Um, I have a little bit of experience um, doing it with, with the sort of two iterations of uh, Watch the Skies. So with that, I'm quite over time, unfortunately, but thank you for, for indulging me. Um, I've started a blog, it's a very big skeleton right now. It's got some information on sort of the first game um, and that's sort of my process of translating. It's available there and you can send me an email at this link. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. That was um, fascinating. Absolutely incredible. I, I'm, I'd just like to echo um, Becky's comment in the chat about the, um, the, the Stargazer bot. That's, yeah, just in, blows me away. It's, it's really impressive. Um, how long did it take for us to sort of design that? Yeah, Forrest, do you want to chime in how long it took? We had, we had two semesters of work. Um, wow, that's um, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Forrest will answer in the chat in a second, but yeah, that's 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 amazing. Um, it looks amazing, just yeah, really incredible. Um, there are some questions here, and if anybody else would like to ask answer any ask any questions of Alan, then uh, please do put them into the into the chat now, and I'll ask them in a second. Um, the first one's from Kevin. Um, it's quite a long one, so so bear with me. Um, if you were running a mega game for people who have a good understanding of how to fairly divide resources, what uh, balance adjustments do you make to the game? He tries to keep it as players in a five bucket, uh, five fires, four bucket state. So they're always working towards something. But uh, what happens if they solve the economy and they start meeting all their needs? Have you um, yeah. I thought? I, I thought about this too. Um, and I've ran simpler, I guess, mini games, <laughs> the opposite of mega games. I ran this sort of war scenario game it was, uh, done by a U of T um, grad student at the time. Uh, where all the players need to do is just not go to war to steal other people's stuff. And I thought, 
what happens if the entire class says, we just want peace, give us 100%? It's never happened so far. <laughs> We've done it twice. Uh, always, there is always multiple wars. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think if they are able to solve it, congratulations, you get, you get full marks or 90% or whatever it is. Um, that is that is the good ending, right? They, they have successfully cooperated um, and they're not scored based on their performance in the game. I think that should be important to highlight. Uh, they do an assignment based on the performance of the game. Sure. And if they did very well, the assignment is very easy. Mm -hmm. uh, if they did poorly, then the assignment is harder. That's, <laughs> the That's where, the, where, the, where the rum reads the road. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. So, so Becky and a couple of others mentioned about screenshots, and I have to say I fall into this trap myself. Um, if, if I play an online game and somebody shares a screenshot, I assume it to be completely legitimate, and, and it, it is the word of God, as it were. Like it's a screenshot; it's come from the game. It must be real. Um, and Becky said that she's played um, games, not mega games specifically, but other Discord and WhatsApp games where screenshots have been sh um, banned from being shared because it's assumed that, that they are real. But obviously, editing um, screenshots is a very good idea like, and people just believe it like you said your students do and, and, and i certainly have like it, it, it would take three minutes for me mm. to edit a screenshot, right? yeah like absolutely very long at all yeah and, no, totally i think in an educational setting i think there's this unwritten you know it's academic integrity right like it's mm. potentially a violation of academic integrity to falsify what the prophet said of course i wouldn't pursue them on the matter because i think it's part of the game but I think they're they're weary enough of that. that I don't think it will happen in the classroom, but certainly out in the wild, I think it's a possibility. Yeah, definitely. Um, Becky's uh, mentioned Den of Wolves. I don't know if you've heard of Den of Wolves. Den of Wolves is another mega game. Think back of Battlestar Galactica, basically. You've got a fleet of um, players who are trying to escape uh, murderous, um, what they're called wolves in the game. But yeah, and, and within the game itself, there are a couple, usually a couple of traitors who are actually working with wolves. So obviously they get activated during the game and so they, they sort of turn on their former comrades. Uh, but Becky mentions Den of Wolves would be a fascinating computer science subject. Uh, sorry, uh, computer science perspective since, um, well, except for the wolves, obviously, because they're against the, um, the, the players themselves. But it's basically a complicated prisoner's dilemma where if everyone cooperated, it would actually just be fine. They have enough resources. They'd be able to trust each other and, and do things. But people are so distrusting in the game. And obviously, it's part of the game as well. It's, it's, it's to sort of fire up that distrust. And sometimes the, the wolves do sabotage things. And maybe the players don't realize there are wolves on board their ships. And so it, it's, yeah, it's a classic prisoner's dilemma that you mentioned earlier on. Yeah, I think trader mechanics are maybe more difficult to do in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of like what the assignment would look like, right? Like if it's, what, you would need kind of a different assignment for, for the wolves or certainly like, yeah, there's there's a, a lot of asymmetry mm. between what the wolves are doing and what the, I don't know, what the re regular people are doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, that, that's pretty much all of the, the questions actually, but you mentioned You'd love to examine some more rule sets uh, for mega games. Uh, we actually have, um, if you go to Mega Game Assembly, I'll, I'll link you afterwards, megagameassembly.com. We've actually got um, some people have given us um, free, um, or their, their rule sets basically. It's not necessarily the full rule set, it might just be like, like your handbook, main handbook and stuff, but I've certainly got quite a few on there that might be interesting to you um, to, uh, to, to read. Um, if, you, if you're looking for more to, to look at. Um, oh, I've got another question here from Becky. Um, you said that players felt like the game was too close. Um, did this play out um, in any less fortunate ways with the expectations of certain countries? Or was there another reason why it felt too close for them? Sorry, too close as in- As oh, in- Too close to home. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, the, the student did not clarify. So it was in a sort of after, um, after the fact sort of survey that was just anonymous. Um, but they felt that 2030 is too, it's too close to modern to like, we can see the conflicts that we are on the precipice of in the modern day potentially happening in this game. And it just felt like a little too close to home. Uh, and they just suggested moving it another 10 years into the future. Um, yeah. So I thought that was an interesting data point that 2030 is too close. Um, I did not think so when I was putting it together. Yeah, no, based on what's happened in the last sort of, what, 10 years, I, I would agree with you. It's not too close at all. Yeah, a lot can happen in, in, in nine years, I guess. Yeah, eight years. absolutely. 
Uh, we've got a question here from Peter. And um, there are various educational modules that have been operating in academia for years, the most notable being reacting to the past games, uh, which are a similar extent um, to, to Model UN. Um, and he's talk in talking to co workers at Carlton, have other um, teachers run any of these similar systems, these similar game systems? Have you spoken to anybody that uh, might have done that? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, I'm not physically at Carlton, so it's very actually very odd for me to like very difficult for me to get casual conversations, right? Because I have to send an email. Yeah. It sounds like I'm formally addressing this person I don't know. Um, so I have not gotten a chance to sort of talk around. But I suspect that in the um, sort of humanities department, in the humanities uh, faculty, they would have something like this. Somebody surely somebody has tried something like this. Uh, but I'm not familiar with it personally. All right, fair enough. Um, Pete says he's in a similar situation uh, to Princeton, and so he feels you feels your pain there. <laughs> Um, Kevin mentioned that Rex Bre uh, Brennan Brennan is at McGill, um, which is apparently a short drive away from Montreal, and he's a political science professor. And I know he's quite active in in sort of the war gaming and gaming scene as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think I've taken a look at his website. I really should mm. send him an email and and, and make make some kind of greeting with him. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right done some very very extensive work in this area mm, yes absolutely uh, but no this is i mean we kind of hit the hour so i'll probably call it there but this is absolutely fascinating thank you alan i, I mean i'm sure everybody's been sending messages really appreciates the, the presentation and i certainly have um it's, it's fascinating so thank you so much um uh, yeah i've got many more questions but maybe we'll, we'll um if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask alan and maybe alan if you're free um there's the pub channel on our mega megacon discord server um, and maybe the conversation can carry on in there when we cancel this now on zoom but uh thank Thank you again it's been it's been really interesting thank you so much yeah thank you for having me here uh, i'll jump in a tub in the, in the pub in a, in a few minutes i'm gonna grab some tea and i'll see you there brilliant thanks very much thanks so much everyone see you later